hey, we're kicking it off. This one I want to do because it's a special one um, for those that have actually been following us, listening to us, you know, as we've evolved, kind of been trying our hand at the podcast world. Um, you know, we've had a lot of success and I would say growth over this past year. This is our one year anniversary of starting the podcast. So yay. Yay. We're one year gonna, anniversary. We're going to have maybe like, a, I don't know, thumbnails, some balloons or some sound effects or something. Who knows? But this is our official one year anniversary. And I will say... It feels like we've really come a long way um, as far as just firing it up and grabbing a, you know, a mixer and some mics and, you know, spinning, you know, some information out there. Um, what we, we do as far as um, intent, content, review, you know, and kind of actually trying to build a program, we've come a really long way in just a year. So. Yeah, I, there's a couple of interesting statistics, you know, um, I posted this on LinkedIn, but 90% of podcasts don't make it past three episodes. I can attest that that's most of our... Well, because we have, <laughs> we, we, we've had failure to launch twice prior before. Maybe one day we'll go find those old unre those old unreleased episodes and... The deep and cuts? They'll be the deep, yeah, extended When we get to 100,000 subscribers, I'll, I'll release the yeah. deep cuts and yeah. you guys can mock me. How's that? <laughs> yeah, uh, they were not great, let's uh. be honest. Um, and then the other 90% that's left after three episodes, they quit after 20 episodes. So we're, we're by far beating the odds. Um, the podcast is, is going great. And I was reading some statistics and it says that usually it takes about two years for a podcast to kind of start finding its home and uh, really starting to have an impact in whatever industry or, or with the audience that they're doing. But yeah, it's that old can, you know, consistency and, and the uh, I think the direction of the podcast when we first started, it was going to almost be like agent trainings and agent conversations and keep yep. keep that going. And I really wondered how we'd be able to do a weekly episode. But now it seems like we could do an episode every day. Correct. And I think we'll sprinkle some of that in. We, we sit here and continue to talk about, you know, broadening our audience and topics. And, you know, we really get great feedback from listeners who are in our business. It's just, it's so niche and intricate and the changes that are happening. And so I think from the people who are like us in it to win it and spend a lot of time, they really enjoy it. But, you know, we want to continue to kind of bring in more enticing content and be a little bit more broad sprinkled here and there. So I think you'll see that as far as especially being more agent facing and being more valuable things that people can take away from the podcast and implement. I think we're going to continue to branch out and do that. But well, you know. one of the things that I think makes our podcast interesting and unique is it's almost like, Nobody wants to ever admit that they listen to it or or <laughs> yeah. comment on it or because there's all sorts of intrigue and it's like like the Crips and the Bloods, you know, like nobody from another FMO wants to make a comment or a carrier or, or or a carrier. They don't wanna they don't wanna say it, but we all we always hear it behind the scenes, you know. And so we we know we have the data. There's about hundred and fifty thousand uh viewers a month right now between YouTube and between uh, you know, our other podcast channels and things like that. And Spotify, Apple, Amazon. Yeah. Yep. Usually, um, you know, quite a, f you know, tens of thousands of unique listeners every week. So we know they're out there. We just, I, I don't think we get quite the interaction. Um, the comments, you just got to stop offending people and calling them lurkers. Cause I've had people be like, Hey, I'm one of your lurkers. So that's what they are. <laughs> but Hey, if, if you are, if you wouldn't mind, we love like, you. We love you, lurkers. We just we love you all. You can comment on our stuff. Tell us, you know, it's funny because a lot of times the only comments that will bubble up are where somebody wants to get mad at us about something or, or call us out on something. But hey, if you're an agent that you just appreciate it, leave us a comment. We're not going to try to recruit you or anything like that. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, you know, it, it helps. So like, comment, subscribe, share, share the podcast. We know, we hear all the time that other entities and FMOs are sharing it within their distribution channels, everything. That's great. That's totally cool. The other thing that we would love as we're just on the topic anyway, and we're talking about interaction more with you all, if you are listening and you're going, Hey, I get value out of this and it's good and I enjoy it, but I would like to hear this. I appreciate your guys's perspective. Obviously if you're tuning in for every episode, we're doing something right. Cause you do like it, but feel free to share too. You know, Hey, I think you guys should do an episode on X, Y, or Z. If it's in our wheelhouse and we feel like we're um, very knowledgeable, then we certainly will do it. 
Yeah. And so, I mean, we're generally talking about, I, I don't know how long, maybe it seems for the foreseeable future, there will always kind of be breaking news-ish in the industry. But this this mm. week we had a... Uh, no, Steve Warner, five years, right? Yeah, so yeah. So we, we have a good tr- runway. <laughs> this this week we had quite the turmoil. Let's, I, let's start with the one I just talked about, though, before we go to the big one. Okay. All right, because... I have to feel like before I get my shield out to defend myself from arrows and pitchforks, let's let's start with the big announcement that I thought hit Monday, and that was from CMS. Um, if you're following it, I, this is one that again, we're, we're the one I'm I'm putting off. I'm putting off talking about the well care and the PDP commissions and that environment. We're, we're going to get there, but what's interesting is to see how up in arms people are about that that we're going to discuss. But the bigger thing that, in in my opinion is there was a big announcement this week that there's going to be a hundred million dollars in grants available to fund navigators. So CMS just announced that, you know, there's a lot going on as we've been talking about the fraud, the switching and changing and instability of, you know, the growth of the ACA. And now there was a big announcement that $100 million are going to be spent over the next five years to fund navigators. And the reason that I think that is huge is because that is, direct competition to you all as insurance agents. And I already think that we have a free market solution. We already have agents and brokers in place. We already have sophisticated distribution. They're already contracted to authorize these carriers. We've already built this very sophisticated model to serve consumers, and yet we're going to introduce more navigators. And we can even say in a lot of these states, there's there's ship counselors, there's other resources to guide, yet $100 million dollars per year over five years is a lot of dollars. And now that's just taxpayer money that is raised because it's all a vacuum. No matter how you slice and dice it, you're going to have to spend money to get people to guide and advise and help people to choose their insurance plan. So my unhappiness with that, and I think is BS, is that the, the better move would be to continue to make more changes within the agent ecosystem, the oversight, the compliance, and, you know, continue to solve the problems that exist rather than trying to double down now, just spend more money. And I don't know that it's going to create a better outcome. And how are those navigators going to be monitored and what are going to be the results and the outcome and how effective are they? And none of that has kind of been announced along with just that there's going to be money in grants yet. So, that's one thing that I think is huge that dropped this week that agents and brokers should feel heartburn about and has been very quiet. Yeah, I, I want to, you know, we <laughs> talked about trying to main, remain as politically neutral uh, before the podcast as, as possible. But, you know, let's just be honest. There's a there's a lot of people stacked in even some of the, the insurance carriers and um, different in pit positions of the government who do not value brokers. And that's not, that's not a political statement. That's apolitical. Um, for whatever reason, they don't want, they think that there's money, there's bias, there's implicit bias that happens there. Um, they maybe had a personal bad experience. They want to move from this model where you do have thriving brokers. I tend to think that that, that philosophy is a, a foundational fundamental philosophy of people that think you know government and regulatories and industries can do better than the than free market principles and capitalistic principles i tend to think those kind of go along those lines but when we've been in the industry for a long time ship counselors have always been around Mm -hmm. and my my experiences and they're not very knowledgeable well two things they don't carry you know Like they don't, like if you're an insurance agent, you have to go through certifications every year with every carrier, with AHIP or through Gorman or through, you know, whatever, uh, through NABIB now. So you do your annual certifications in addition to your CE credits for your insurance license, in addition to the carrier specific trainings. And so there is a lot of training that goes into it. And to your point, and also a broker carries, you know, so if they screw up, you know, then they have that error and omission insurance. Well, ship counselors don't have that. They don't carry that. Um, now, if someone can crawl off, you know, into the slide into our comments and say, well, I work in this particular state and we do, maybe that's the case. But in my experience, most states, they don't carry that liability coverage either. And to your point, they go through one 
kind of training session, and then they're stamped and certified to help and guide people. And people think, well, because they're not financially biased or motivated by a commission, I'm going to get better advice from that person, which, again, I think is a... It's a it's a bad premise, and I think that that's not accurate, and they're not always getting the best advice. and And maybe I'm being altruistic that a lot of the brokers we work with are phenomenal. But um, anyway, my, my analogy would be: if you watch Suits, do you want to get help from Harvey Specter as a lawyer, or maybe the the free clinic social worker that or that or, maybe or your assigned public defendant? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you know, well, and and what you were saying about is uh, about the system being the way it is already, we already have a free market system that when it's working properly is designed to function the exact way that it needs to be. And it's one of the things that we've always liked about the Medicare and specifically the Medicare Advantage model is, look, if you are an insurance agent, you have a professional license, you have had a background check, you've gone through this process with a state regulatory body, you have a fiduciary duty to do what's right for the client. So you are ethically, morally, and legally obligated to act in the best interest of your clients and your consumers. And if you're a licensed insurance agent and you're a broker, and and let's say you're doing Medicare and specifically MedAdvantage, because we're gonna talk broader about this later on yep. um, in this episode, but you, the system is designed so that your impartiality benefits you right and that when you do a good job you should be you as an agent want to help those clients and you want them to be what's the system rewards you for placing them in a plan that will be the best for them long term beneficially right like it's there's no longer are these days well whoever pays me the largest you know, commission is who I'm going to place it with. What you want is good quality residual business. Sustainability. Sustainability. Right. That's right. what everybody ultimately wants. And you don't get that by, you know, a one-time shot or screwing somebody over. And in addition to that, CMS has already made it. And we've gone through this whole difficulty this year of trying to, you know, redo the system. But for standardization. Yeah, there's there's yeah. already standardization where the commissions pay the same. And and so I think that we're trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. The main problem that's ever existed with any sort of broker community or anything are bad actors, right? And whenever there's a hand, and it's a very, very, very small percentage of people, as all the agents we've ever interacted, you do occasionally come across somebody who is desperate, usually financially, they're stupid, they're, they lack immoral, ethics, they don't morals. have integrity. Yeah. But those people are short lived and they're quickly out of the industry and they are punished, you know, very, very, uh, quickly. And it's, it's, it's rare that they can operate and do what they do for a sustainable long period of time. Correct. And right. it's rare. And this year you've had a little bit of, especially on the ACA side, you've had some massive bad, bad actors that have caused catastrophic damage across, uh, across the industry. And what happens well, is the consumers too. Right? Correct. Yeah. So what happens is, you know, the consume all things are not equal, right? And what happens is regulator regulators, um, government entities, congressmen, state officials, uh, Department of Insurance agent commissioners start going, "Oh my gosh, you have this rampant bad actors." And what happens is, in their mind, they get this idea that these independent agents are these rich ruthless cutthroat people making all this right. money and they've got to be reined in because they're just getting rich and they're flying on their private jets and they're riding on their yachts with all this Medicare advantage and right. PDP insurance money. And the reality is, is that is the very, very small percentage of people. And I think, you know, it's, not it's, it's the kind of maybe not the 1%, but maybe two, 3%, like the tops. I mean, it's very small. No, I right? look, I think that our industry, you know, we've had some acquisitions and you've seen some roll-ups and there's some celebra celebration of that kind of stuff. And it makes it seem like everybody out there is just freaking becoming multimillionaires it driving around. A, it paints a picture that's maybe not accurate. Correct. And yeah. so what it gives, it gives, it gives ammo to these regulatory bodies. They're like, Oh my gosh, look at all these, the agents are out there all driving Lambos and, and, and riding on yachts on the backs of the Medicare advantage consumers. And the reality is, do you know how much the average insurance health insurance agent makes that produces I actually, anything? I actually don't know that it's $53,000. Yep. And that, and that's, that's like a, what a teacher makes. Yeah. You know, and, and that's whatever. what the average, I mean, to be honest, 
90%, we know that 90% of health insurance agents or insurance agents in general don't make any money. They, right. They're bounced out of the business within two years. And if you took the average of what actual earning insurance agents is, it's 53 grand. And you know, someone's going to ask you, where did you get that statistic? You know, you're going to be challenged uh, on it. Uh, well, I'll go, f someone go research it and I'll go research it. But that is a, that is a, an anecdotal thing. I can't cite you the, the exact website there, but uh, I will find that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to post it. But Fantastic. I, I, to, to your point, yes, I think that there's a lot of that going on. And I will say too, that I think um, from a regulatory perspective, I think that most of the time too, it comes from a genuine place of we want to try to fix it. And so I think they're well-intentioned. I think that you have insurance commissioners. I think you have people at CMS. I think you have lawmakers. I think you have people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned. I don't think that they're trying to be calculating or nefarious or anything else for the most part. And they're just trying to solve the problem, but how they're approaching solving the problem isn't correct. What, what we need in, in, I just came up with a great idea. In, in health insurance with CMS and like OCR and uh -oh, health and human don't services. Don't give away a good business model. No, no, here. no. This is yeah. what, it, just like all the other three-letter government agencies, we need to hire those regulators, like how the pharma companies, the Purdue Pharmas were hiring the FDA heads and, you know, all of them. They, they just need to get hired by these health insurance companies to let then like make the rules and then, you know, we can have all the use and abuse of all these other industries. Why, why is no one not doing that? Why are we not greasing the wheels of CMS and HHS a little bit more like uh, some of these other regulatory that bodies? Just, that just stabbed their ears with, with needles when you just said that. You I know? don't want that. I'm being <laughs> facetious, right? I really do believe that, like we talked about a couple episodes ago, the market is the market, the market, right? Free market principles will always cor course correct. We saw that in our industry with the really bad unsustainable practices of some of the large e-tele brokers. Right. And so what you need to do is you need to target and remove the actual true bad actors and the ones that are truly causing fraud. But Well, I, I would say to go, to go back to the initial what started this dialogue that we're having and talking about it is the hundred million dollars for five years. I think a, a better thing would be, Hey, we're going to do some small budget and increase budgets at the state level for some more ship counselors. And Hey, let's address and let's look at the type of training that ship counselors are giving and making sure, and let's make sure it lines up that it's equal to or more than what an insurance agent is. Let's look at that. And then let's also continue to lean into more, you know, the regulatory body, CMS, to these carriers, like the regulation that is occurring, um, and make sure that it's appropriate. And they should, they could spend far less money doing those two things than I think just spinning up a whole nother, you know, here's our new plan. Let's, let's, let's lean into this and spend more money. Yeah. So, so, to, so to reframe, there's definitely an appetite and a perception amongst some people and regulators that government websites and, and, Government officials should be helping people altruistically. My contention is that I don't think that, that government always is the best use of funds and it's as efficient and as effective as free market dollars and free market principles. I mean, that's kind of why we have the Medicare system that we have right now is exactly right. because of that. Um, and I also think that there's not a lot of accountability or oversight on what are the results of what those ship counselorships do and how do you, how are you um, how are we quantifying how many people were actually able to help right well so I, I can my counterpoint like I could say like okay Dan hey supply me with some information about why a broker would be better than you know a ship counselor or something like I can tell you with a lot of our agents that write enrollments I can tell you what their accretion rate is like how many apps go into effect I can tell you their rapid disenrollment rates I can tell you their CTM percentages of sales versus enrollment I can actually look at their retention rates year over year. I can also point to when they're doing an app through some of our technology and tools. Are they putting down a primary? If it's an HMO plan, did they put in a PCP? Are they voluntarily doing that on a PPO plan and helping with doc selection? I can say, are they using the BEQ utilization for finding you know meds and qualifications for plans? Are they entering in their docs? So I have 
technology that we've invested in and training and tools to where I can quantify and know who's doing a great job and who's not doing a great job. I have that information and data and I don't know, like, could, could I get that from somebody who's like a ship counselor or someone giving free advice? Um, you know, I hear a lot online on forums, uh, free advice at the local library or the ship counselor office. I don't think that they could provide me that data. It, but I also would say that, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn. We do a better job than most people, you yeah. know, but we can, but we have that information. So, well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to still encourage that. I think that a, a smart, sophisticated broker who is compensated on the value that they are able to bring to the market and thusly rewarded by being good and being able to get in front of beneficiaries and help more people is always going to be substantially more beneficial than an in and out, you know, state or, or federally government employee that may or may not have those same skill sets in place. And, and the whole motivation of a broker commission, just again, which is always in question and more and more this year, there's a lot of heartburn about paying a trail and a residual commission to a, to a broker or an agent in perpetuity or in life. But that's the whole financial motivation, right? Is we, we've talked about it maybe 10 times on the podcast. Show me your comp plan. I'll show you the behavior. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that you're compensating a broker to you know, continue to put them on a great plan and continue to get paid year over year over year or to, you know, revisit and reevaluate their situation and put them on an appropriate plan so that that broker can be paid over the life cycle of that consumer and continue to do the best thing for them, right? And that's the premise of the whole trail renewal commissions. And if, and if you're a broker and you're not doing that, you do suck and you probably shouldn't be getting paid that. And my last piece of this just to zoom out and and then this is my final thought on it is if you were to calculate the entire worth of medicare and aca distribution of the entire country how much that is all the brokers all the insurance agents how much they all get compensated the, what is the the technology the vendors tech, the to help all of these people what is the current cost or value of that system to help those people I would say if you tried to replace that with a ship counselor system or a it, you put all of that honest or accountability on the government to try to help and explain all these people with campaigns and funds and things like that, it would actually be much, much more expensive and there would be many more dollars spent much more inefficiently to try to replace that ecosystem. I agree. Um, and I, I will go to my graves standing by that. And of course, you know, that's us. And so that, of course that's going to be our opinion, but I would, you mean you're biased. Yeah, huh? I would, I would, I feel confident in, in having that position. So. I, of course I agree, you know, and we, we all agree. And it's, it's just going to be that this little bit of back and forth and trying to balance that, but we kind of see the direction of where things are going. And it's just, it's just a valid thing that we want people to be aware of because more often than not, like those are things that we see here and we know not only of the announcement, but implementation of it and the impact and what it's going to look like in a few years. And anyways, so that was a big thing we wanted to really spend time talking about because again, we didn't think it got much, um, much press. I don't think it got much, much airtime out well, there well in that's the because community. the big news of the week was I'll let the, you, the the big one was the pdp apocalypse yeah and yeah yeah we should call it that that's we're we gonna call it are we gonna name this, this episode this episode's called the, PDP. Called the pdp 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 apocalypse whatever it is there we go pd apocalypse and it's yeah we have been i mean i'm not happy i'm i've i have gotten i've gotten amusement a little bit i would say this last week over just this this ruling with obviously well care, um, Aetna's kind of in the, the background of it. It's mostly at the forefront. They got of off his, easy, right? Like <laughs> yeah, they were like, oh, we just announced we're not paying commissions. But Aetna's yeah, Aetna's management's like, cool. They man. went they well, went ten times well harder. Care, you know? Yeah, they went ten <laughs> times harder. We're off the hook. Um, the big news has been about you know well care making the decision to not pay any PDP commissions, both future commissions and you know, legacy or renewal policies that, you know, and it's been kind of determined widely from everybody that there were kind of provisions or language within their agreement that allowed them to do that. 
Um, and so from a legal perspective, I think that most people at this point, after they immediately got their torch, they got their pitchforks and they were ready to storm the castle, um, you know, and I, and I think that's still going to be the temperament. We, we can talk about how I, it's going to I get don't worse. think I've seen the agent community in large be as, as uniformly united and, right. and up in arms against this. And for me, it's just a little... I felt like there were other critical industry threats, like when they were when it was on on the table of possibly eliminating all um, FMOs and overrides. I think there were other existential threats that were much more long term damaging to the industry that kind of sl right. slid by the wayside. That um, well, well, let's be honest. We we have a, a different opinion than some, but candidly, I think if you were eliminating FMOs or trying to get rid of that part in the supply chain and that ecosystem and, you know, things went through in the call letter like they were and brokers got a $100 increase in commissions, they don't understand that, I mean, widely, most brokers don't understand that they would be far more impacted financially by that than they are this PDP thing. But, Correct, but or, yet, or it would have been a much more overall but, wrong step in the direction correct, towards all of this. But they couldn't connect the dots of all the pieces and, and how that would have affected them, and so they weren't as up in arms. But yeah, this going back to the well care being at the forefront of it, they it's de been determined by most at this point that it wasn't legal, and it's more now a question of what, but it's ethically wrong, and it shouldn't be, you know, you've asked us as a broker community to grow your product, to sell for you, to, you know, be a partner and offer these products to consumers, and now, now you're screwing us and not paying us. And so that's the, the general sentiment to it all, right? And we are sympathetic, right? I mean, that there are people who have built large aspects of their business because WellCare has been the market leader in these products for years and years and years. And so even though the commissions are relatively small, there are people who it, it has a major, major financial impact on. And I think that, you know, for some of those people, that really sucks. You know, I mean, that's your, that's your mortgage payments throughout the year. That's the, the whatever that now all of a sudden you're in a place where you have to replace that. And it, it is, it is definitely hard and it impacts us too. I mean, we have, yep. Um, you know, we're, I don't think anybody that's in the business. I, um, yeah, I, I want to jump in though, too, and kind of talk about though, like this, it's kind of new, but it isn't new. I mean, the renewal piece of it is new, but the non-commissionable PDP thing has not been new. I mean, um, I'm happy that Cigna just turned back on their commissions for PDP, but for a number of years, they were non-commissionable. There were always, you know, when I was a broker selling plans, there was a whole list of all these different PDP products, and there were several who were not commissionable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Humana's got one in their por one in their portfolio that's not commissionable. Um, we're actually we have documents and trackers for brokers that can show which carrier has which PDPs and which ones pay commissions and which ones don't, um, you know, to try to help agents understand that. But it's kind of the renewal piece is new, but not paying commissions on thing is not new. So that's my other thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll even throw it out there. I, I guess I'll be nice and chivalrous and not name names. But I've even had a carrier that we perform work for as an FMO and we didn't even have wrongdoing. And we had this FM or this carrier come to us, terminate our contract, not only terminate it, overrides our LOA payments, our actual agent commissions, our everything, and just say, we're not going to pay you anything anymore. And it was not a small amount. It was probably $40,000 a year in revenue. It probably was, over the trail of it, a $300,000 impact. It was total crap. But um, total garbage. And maybe that carrier's listening and they'll know it's total garbage. That carrier but, is listening. But, um, you know, totally garbage. But you didn't hear me getting my pitchfork out. And I just think to myself, the market is going to work it out. Like, it's going to take care of itself. When they do those kind of business decisions, ultimately there will be rep ramifications from it. And I think that that poor decision is going to impact them and it's going to work itself out. Because the market, the free market will resolve it. And so that's my well, position on it. Well, and, and to that point, I mean, that's what's going to happen with WellCare. You know, I mean, it's, they are going to see, it's like the bed is made mm -hmm. and those decisions were made. And now, now we, we're going to see how, how that pans yeah, out. I, you know? But I'm going to step in here though, and kind of I don't want to be painted as the big apologist. So please, like, oh my gosh, like I'm already thinking about our YouTube comments and how like Dan is such a, a simp for well, okay, I'm just going to dive in and say, though, 
they have so much PDP membership. And if you look at, and I'm just going to say, by the time this episode airs, it's going to be worse and you're going to be even more mad because word on the street is that the well care PDP plans have phenomenal benefits this next year from, from word on the street. Um, it's going to look, of course, very even worse and people are going to be more upset because from a consumer perspective and looking at product, they're going to want the plan, I, I think. And so, but the, it's going to look as though they were able to build and structure their plan that way off of the sweat of the backs of the agents. And, right? and by screwing and, the agents out of the commission and, and taking that and then rebuilding those and then getting a market edge. And it's, it's not, I mean, there's a lot of nuance behind the scenes that, that we're aware of and that are not connected. There's some different silos and it's not that way, but it, the market is going to perceive it that way. That's just me saying that. But what I was kind of talking about is from not trying to be an apologist, but they have so much membership versus the other carriers out there. And what people are maybe failing to understand is the smoothing process and the cost shifting. And when you're looking at their millions of members that they have on PDP and then having to have whatever percentage of that of people who have higher cost drugs now with the Inflation Reduction Act and having to have that smoothing process where they're essentially a interest-free money lender where they have to finance people's medications all across the year, that's capital that from an actuarial perspective, you have to account for that and you have to hold that and you have to have the ability to, to do that. And that's a big, huge financial burden when you have that much membership too. Um, and so there's that element to it. That, that And then if you're holding that much capital, you're not able to put that capital to work into your other real profit-making products like Medicare Advantage, DSNP, CSNP, those other things that are very profitable for you. Because let's be honest too, I think one of these really unintended consequences or intent, I don't know, of this Inflation Reduction Act is there's just not much meat on the bones on, P on a standalone PDP. There's not much profit to be made in creating a standalone part drug plan. And when you're starting to now add this element of capping it and smoothing and everything else involved with it, you're now having to financially incur so much risk in bidding and creating products and then having to incur that smoothing process. And what's your upside on profit on a PDP? It's razor thin, if yeah, any. Yeah, so, I, I, I made a couple posts online on some Facebook groups and, and LinkedIn. And I was just, you know, I wanted to kind of take a beat and just explain things from WellCare's perspective. Not that, in, in full disclosure, we both agree that moving towards non-commissionable is is bad for the industry right. uh, especially it's, it's a bad precedent especially removing the vested commissions it's 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 bad for the business overall it's bad for our business as an fmo it's bad for valuations in in your company it's bad for stable predictability and trust and it and it's it's going to harm some of the, as we're seeing, I, like I said, I haven't seen agents this up in arms against the carrier over anything. And, uh, you know, it's hard to quantify the cost benefit analysis of that. Right. But I, I did want to, you know, explain how well care is different, right? Because they are well care is owned by, by Centene, uh, their well care is a subsidiary and they've had a lot of growth by acquisitions over the past five or six years and there's been a lot of conglomeratization of some of these former industries and the way that they got their pdps and in fact a couple of years ago when aetna was acquired by cvs mm -hmm. they had to divest i believe it was eight hundred thousand or just under a million members members to well care they picked up a bunch there and then the fact that last year you know they were a 50 cent pdp you said they, last year, 2024. Yeah, this current plan year. Yeah. And they, they gained a lot of membership as well. And I think the broker community is saying, oh, well, you did this strategically because you knew the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in 2022. You should have planned. You should have prepared. You introduced a low cost, no cost PDP. So we'd all get baited to move our membership there. And then you screwed us, right? And that's the, the feelings and the sentiment of a lot of the broker community. But that's not the w the way that the the process works, you know, as far as plan design. And also, when the Inflation Reduction Act passed, there was a lot of uncertainty, and the carriers don't instantly know how to, how 
that's going to affect it. They don't know what the reimbursement rates are going to be. They don't know what the rebates are going to be. They don't know what the, the, the national NABA. average they don't bid know what gonna be. is going they to be. They don't know that. And and a lot of times the way that the premium ended up being 50 cents last year was because of that process, not because WellCare was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to stick it to the brokers next year. So let's get them all to With this place. long-term scheme. Yeah, yeah with this long-term scheme. But, but not only that... Centene is is the largest um, provider of the of state Medicaid's Medicaid, in the yep. country. I, they they manage the Medicaid networks for thirty seven out of the fifty states, and as part of that, you they sign a, a contract with the states where they're auto assigned those PDPs right for all the LIS and all the duals. They get round robin assigned. Um, between anybody else that has yeah it's not they don't get exclusively 100 percent. usually there's a few payers or carriers that have those contracts and they then to mike's point it's like you get one you get one you get one and they auto assign pdp and that's why you have like benchmark plans and you know so they have to go on a benchmark type plan or lower um so that it completely covers their part d premium um and anyways yes they get auto assigned so so the way that they grew was a lot of that PDP, you know, they have a lot of uh, prescription drug plan only that are LIS, they're low income subsidies, and they've been auto assigned, um, or they have state Medicaid contracts, and they're not on a dual plan. So they have uh, the PDPs assigned as well. And if you look at that block of membership, you know, there's funding that comes from the state Medicaid departments and also Medicare as well. But that particular large block of business, they're over indexed on a lot of those LIS and dual people. So if you even if they had the exact same amount of PDPs as an Aetna or a United or a Humana or anything, their risk pool of utilization is much higher skewed than any of these other carriers because as we all know yep lower income people dual people the social determinants of health low higher utilization in general they have much higher utilization right so they already have the shifting cost burden of the allocation of the new uh, ira on the pdp plans but what was dan was talking about too with the with the smoothing process and the financial needs there the amount of cash reserves and operating funds that they need to hold when they're trying to pencil out the the needs for it just made it really, really difficult. And so I think early on in the year, the bean counters, the financial finance department thought, well, we got to err on the side of being cautious here. And we have to err on the side of being able to have operating funds and cash flow because we don't know how much this smoothing um, process is going to affect us. Right. Right. They also don't know with this demonstration process that CMS came out. And by the way, where are we at with the demonstration process? Who knows? Did it did it get approved? Are they actually doing it? Is there funding for it? Because, you know, Health and Human Service said, we're going to fund this and do it. And then the Government Accountability Office said, hold the phone. That's our lane. You didn't get it approved. You can't just do that. Um, And I haven't heard, you know, I'll just be candid. I haven't followed up on that to find out if it's being challenged and if the funding for it is going to go through or if the government accountability office is going to cry foul and um, halt that. I don't know. Yeah. And so we, we don't really have a, a who's who official list of who opted in to that demonstration period, who didn't. Um, But if you're a carrier too, and you see that Congress asked the government accountability office to challenge this and you're going, oh, they got kind of a good point. Well, but not only that, how many times did you want to redo all your bids this year? Yep. Three, three times, four times, five times? You know, you're getting down into August and you know you want to redo all your plan design and bid process and pay your attorneys and actuaries and everybody for the third or fourth time this year? At what point do you go, it, it just is what it is and we got to let the chips fall where they may this year? So you know, the gist like, of it is, they had to make some hard decisions early on. They erred on the side of what they did. They erred on the side of trying to have a little bit more operating capital, um, operating funds. And that and the, the decision that they penciled in was to eliminate broker new and renewal commissions. And I'm sure that was a hard decision to make. And what the overall long-term effect is, I think they'll, you know, they're going to have to be living with those decisions for the next few yeah. years. But two things that I'll add to that too. Number one, 
you know, we're not official spokespeople for Centennial Well Care. Like, we're not giving you their official position. I'm very sure with all this, they're going to be publishing very public comments on the nature of the decision and X and Y. I would imagine that there's going to be kind of press releases about it. I would just guess. So I we are not the official spokespeople. This is just, again, like always, our hot take on it. We have a lot of industry knowledge. We have a lot of context. We have a lot of conversation. And this is kind of like our, our know, read on it of, yeah. of the situation. So number one. Number two, the other thing I would say is, again, I'm not trying to really be, be an apologist about it. You know, it's just more, I think that there's lack of information out there with the broker community. And so it's natural for them to arrive at all these conclusions and naturally be upset. But um, like I said, there's just more at play than what I think people understand. Yeah, and it, and it will be further compounded when the benefits come out and they are good. And, and what's going to happen is I'm really sympathetic to the position that a lot of these brokers are going to be put in because right. what's going to happen is... Here's a awesome plan. You, yeah, you have a block of business already with WellCare and you, you know you're not going to be making commissions on it going forward. You're going to lose that. And yet... They announced the plans for next year and they're going to be strong. And so it's going to be the, the moral, the ethical, the right thing to do is going to be to leave them on that plan in a lot of cases. And at which point you are no longer going to be able to be compensated on that. Or, or you're marketing and spending money to grow your clients and you come across and quote and run it through Sunfire or CMS, .gov, whatever you're using, and you find that this is probably going to be the most financially beneficial product for your client. And you know, you're not going to get paid commission on it. Correct. Or if, if you have to move it, right. And you move it and let's say Aetna is going to be the right plan. Well, Aetna is no longer commissionable. So you're not going to get paid on that either way. Right. Um, so you're going to have to move down your depth chart. You know, I always joke about quarterbacks. Yeah. You go to your first read, you go to your second read, you go to your third read, you know, you're, you, you might, it's an ethical conundrum because then the broker is, you know, not paid for maybe one or two plans that are good for your client, you're working your way down the list to maybe the third or fourth choice. And that might have some significant financial impacts to your clients. And so it is hard. Yeah. And, and so it, it is going to be, be difficult. And I believe that most agents are going to, you know, unfortunately just take it on the chin and they're going to leave a lot of their clients where they're at once this comes out. And they're just going to have to find a way to replace that that revenue into their business. But, but let me ask you this. I, I want, go ahead and comment agents. If you want comment, can, I don't know if, can we do a survey in YouTube comments or a link to it? Maybe Matt, that's a question. We're, we're going to put a link to a survey in this episode. And if you're a broker listening, let me ask you though, the question, let's just pretend in some world that Centene or Wellcare came back out and said, you know what, guys, you're right. You're all really pissed. Um, that was a bad decision and we're going to reverse our position. And now we're just going to agree to um, pay the renewal. We're still not going to pay future commissions, but we're going to pay renewals now. We're we're going to be like Aetna, and we're going to pay your renewals. Sorry about that. I, I, I changed my mind. Do, are you going to forgive them? Do you suddenly go, you know what? Yeah, we banded together. We, we got them to change their mind. They did the right thing for us. Are you going to now feel comfortable with them and be a good broker and sell their products? Or are you going to hold a grudge and go, I still don't trust them and I'm going to sell their products? That's, that's I think, a really interesting question. That we, we discussed that yesterday off camera, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I do think that, um, you know, the, most of these brokers are good and ethical and they're going to do what's right. I think that's going to be the prevailing thing of the day. But it, because it's going to also be a hard sale to go to your client, and be like, hey, we have to review your coverage. I'm gonna, I got to move you to this more expensive plan, and your, and your, you know, your deductible, you're gonna hit that fast, and there's gonna be more out of pocket. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a hard sale. Well, so, let me ask you this though too. So I think going back to the demonstration period, PDP, everything else, just know this is a this is a one year thing anyway for 2025. I mean, so even with funding going through or some of these other plans being stable and you have other carriers outside of WellCare and Aetna and you have others saying, we're raising our hand, we're paying commissions, we're good. They probably opted into the demonstration period and they penciled it out to where it works. But what happens if they raise their hand, they're paying commissions, everything's kosher and they get a significant influx of new PDP enrollments, 
Fast forward to this time next year and for 2026, and now they have all this new membership. There's no demonstration period funding. Are those carriers paying PDP commissions? Yeah, who, who I mean, knows? And that's where we're at overall when we talked about the funding environment with the country and the deficit and all that last, last year is ultimately, at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for something. Somebody has to fit, foot the bill. Um, there are real costs for these things. There are real costs for healthcare. There's real costs for healthcare. And no matter how you shift it and allocate it and try to carve up who's going to pay for what, at the end of the day, when Here. things are expensive, it has to get paid for some way, somehow. And, and I think that I can't stop mentioning this, and I'm going to just add it, even though I'm just throwing a grenade in here, uh, about the reason I've been critical about the Inflation Reduction Act and you know who's paying for it and the drug costs and everything. Look, you got all these parties in the healthcare system, and I think there's two people missing from the party that should be paying more, meaning that with the Inflation Reduction Act and changing this structure, the 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 taxpayer is going to pay more because you know obviously they just said hey we're going to do a demonstration period and raise this money so the general taxpayer is paying more the um the carrier is paying more and it hurts them with this smoothing process right so the carriers are are taking it on the chin you know but um and so are a lot of beneficiaries because they're going to pay more in the, premiums and deductibles. the medicare beneficiary themselves for the lion's share more people are going to experience an an increased you know, premium deductible out of pocket cost versus those few that get a much better coverage option. So they're all paying more. But the two people that I think are very involved in this that got a hard pass would be the PBMs who are still getting rebates when people go and use their plan and rebates are being kicked back to the PBMs. They got a pass. And I also think that Big Pharma got a huge fat pass as well. And so when I Frickin look at Big this, Pharma. When, and, <laughs> and I am critical about it, it's because I think that it could have been done different to involve them more and to shift those costs and have them have some burden in this. And that's what I think should have been included in the discussion and how to cost shift. Well, well one of the major selling points and one of the major talk tracks of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, for PDP was that it was we can negotiate drug prices for these carriers, right? right? But there's very limited ability to do so right now and very few uh, drugs that are impacted and how that actually, we're not seeing any of those benefits yet and how that actually plays out long-term is, and, is and, yet to be seen. And they have to stop adding exempted drugs that they can't too. You know, that's the hard thing is it's like, oh yeah, you can negotiate on these ones that are, you know, lower, but not on these new groundbreaking ones that are the most expensive. You know, there's, it's... It's, we should do a whole podcast one day on the current state of the pharmaceutical industry and how the, and and the uniqueness of the United States and and all that. We, that's one that we should definitely get somebody need from to do. Eli Lilly on here to talk. About yeah, that. somebody can we we can do a pros. We can do a, a good and a, a good cop bad cop episode. But you know, here what I've seen the the agents and the agencies that are the most up in arms about this, Dan, are a lot of times they're the supplement heavy agents, right? Because they're overly indexed on supplements to begin with. Yeah, but let's and, before keep going, but yeah. we find that we talk about the agent community. 50% of the agents in the middle are very balanced and right, med sup, med advantage, good balance, good portfolio mix, and then you have 25% that are these I'm 100% med sup, you know, never medicare advantage or the other 25% that are outliers that are I only sell med advantage and no med sup. So, yeah, and and, and I've seen just the people that are the most angry and are the most up in arms are the ones that are the big med sup carriers or the med, med sup agents, Sellers, right? Sellers, yeah. And, and I think that if you're one of those agents, you're just as bad as an only advantage plan agent or, or something like that, where you think myopically that only supplements are the way to go. And there are still agents that think that. And if you're one of these agents where you crap on advantage plans all the time and you just you out there tell your clients their disadvantaged plans and sit there and talk about how to, you coach your clients to never get convinced to get sold one of these dirty advantage plans. You're also part of the problem yeah. and, and, and you're not a very good agent. And you're also crapping on the same carriers providing those advantage plans that are providing very needed part D plans for your clients as well. So you're really pooping on the advantage plan companies who are also servicing your client 
um, on their part, part D plan. Correct. So, Cause despite what you may personally think in your personal bias and how you may think that SUP stick better than advantage plans or whatever your reasoning may be, or you had, you live in an area where supplements are more advantageous if people can afford them. There are millions and millions of people who advantage plans work well for that they love, who are fantastically happy with, who have served a great purpose. And I, I will say, you know, some of these agents, well, what can you do? Have you, have you honestly and truly evaluated if some of these advantage plans may be good? Are you one of these agents that if you took a, a real hard look at yourself and your business and said, have you actually evaluated, would it be beneficial financially and otherwise to move to an advantage plan? And, and again, I'm not like out there right. putting my pro advantage hat on or pro carrier hat, but I will tell you there are many, many people out there who when they are fully explained both options between a supplement and a PDP and their costs and an advantage plan and the pros and cons of that, they opt into choosing advantage plans very, very often or not. Right. And I'll just say this. I've probably converted 500 people over that were supplement only and PDPs to advantage plans. And I've only ever switched two people back. But I think that I'm going to add in a little more color though. You have a lot of industry experience and knowledge and acumen and properly portray it not because you're good at screwing people over, that you're able to understand and, and articulate, you know, how to use the plan and how it functions, whereas maybe newer agents or less experienced people or unethical people maybe do not. Correct, um, and I wouldn't have moved those people off of right. it. Or, and, and but we, yeah. we, we sell supplements. Don't get your pitchforks and torsages. We have our parent. Our, yes, my, uh, my parents are, my, my, my dad is on a supplement. So, yeah, yes, we sell supplements. But... Um, I will um, also tell you, though, that I, I do have a lot of disdain, though, too, for the insurance agents that just sell a supplement and then don't do the PDP. Because when I look at a client and somebody, a lot of times the meds that they're taking, that is a, you know, especially people who are fairly healthy and they take four or five medications and their maintenance drugs, that's their biggest healthcare expense for a lot of people, not their two doctor visits a year on the supplement. And so, when I come across the agents are like, yeah, I don't want to do a hip and certifications and I don't want to take the time to invest, to be a really good professional and help my clients with everything. I just want to sell them a supplement, you know, trash the advantage plans. And here's the number for 1-800-MEDICARE. That's a bad agent, you know, because you're really not providing value to your client and you're leaving a giant gaping hole in their coverage. And if you don't, they might get a late enrollment penalty or they're going to need help with that part D and they're going to call around and find somebody else. And then you're like, Oh, some dirty agent stole my client and sold them an advantage plan. So yeah. And, and I, there are a lot of, yeah. Yeah. So I just, that's my, my pet peeve is with those agents who aren't looking at the whole picture for a client. And, and then conversely to the, the agents that are only selling advantage plans and they've been doing it for nine years. And then they call me and they're like, Hey, what is uh what is guarantee issue on a And you're like, Oh my gosh. Like, I mean, it, it's like, why, why can't you just be a professional that gets your certifications done and has a very pragmatic approach to helping your client? Well, well again, guys, and this is one of the things I love about this year is it's forcing all of the agent community to actually be better, to be smarter, to know more about what's going on, to be able to do a better needs analysis, to be able to more accurately explain how the industry works and explain it to consumers. So I think that's making the, it's requiring that the average agent that's being successful is much, much, much smarter than the past decade has required. Yeah. What's a Heidi? What's a Fidey? What's a, yeah. It's to, to wrap this all up. Um, are we going to talk about um, supplemental? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, good. Well, I don't know if we'll have time for that, but I wanted to mention um, section 1557 for uh, while we're on the topic of supplements as well. Se section 1557 ha and how it's being applied to the uh, supplements is still not clarified. In fact, the NAIC was just recently talking about it with a lot of these entities to define insurance carriers that are principally engaged in healthcare versus those who are not. Because if they apply it as it is, it's going to increase. So the ones that are like the Humanas, the Aetnas, the ones that are principally Cigna. engaged in healthcare, the Cygnas, they're going to have to abide by a different set of principles and let and not be able to uh, discriminate based on any of these uh, actuarial variables. And those costs would go up substantially on supplements. And so what it would essentially do if it goes into a place, 
just as it is right now, it would create a two tiered system mm -hmm. where the healthcare providers, and then you're going to see the cottage industry of a lot of these health insurance or life insurance and others not principally engaged, Ancillary. Yep. start getting into the supplement business again and be in those carriers as well at a lower rate because they're not held to the same standards. And incredibly, the OCR that put this ruling out has not actually re-clarified and given any final ruling for this. So here we are, September is in two days, and these carriers still don't know exactly how that's going to apply. But I only wanted to bring it up, guys, because if you are one of these supplement seller onlys and you're reading the writing on the wall and you go, prices are going up, they may go up exponentially, prices are going up on PDPs, you've got to be a well-rounded agent. You've got to be able to look at things on a holistic approach and say, it, maybe a Medicare Advantage plan is good for this person. Maybe all things considered with their costs and if their meds... Or, or maybe I don't like either one of these options and I'm going to choose the lesser of the two evils. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to sell them a, a supplemental, you know, or a chronic or critical illness or dental vision hearing plan in addition to... Um, but you need to be... A holistic agent you've got to be able to explain both things because you can't be um so rigid in your your ideology about believing one thing or the other and the other thing i want to say is we as an agent community have to stop trashing one thing that we don't like and complaining about one thing all the time repeatedly because it just adds to the chaos and it just gives more fuel to like regulators and things like that to be. See, it's just a mess. It's all we all got to step in and fix. Let's all this. just hit the nuclear button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I agree with that completely. Um, the the last thing that I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna drop like a like a little nugget that we can talk about more on the next episode is just also all this chaos and you know people you know, changing their coverage, whether it's up to advantage, advantage to supplement, there's going to be a lot more movement happening this, this year. The other thing to mention is there's going to be an increase in these supplemental and ancillary products. As we continue to see a trend of Medicare Advantage benefits decreasing, and like you were just describing, where some people maybe can't get priced out of the MedSup market because of MedSup's and PDPs, and they do advantage, mm -hmm. you're going to have people buying standalone dental plans, DVH plans, hospital indemnity plans, critical illness plans. I think we are going to see a surge of that and to be very candid with everybody. And if I do have regulators listening, you know, to this, we actually don't make money in our ACA call center. Like we don't make profit. The only way that you make profit is your attachment rate. So basically like by the time you pay wages, commissions, you know, technology systems, and you're running on ACA commissions, it's very unstable. The only way that you make money is by adding in and asking like gaps in coverage, like maybe they have a high deductible plan. And so you're um, attaching a hospital indemnity plan to it, or there's not great dental plan embedded. And so you have to give them an extra dental. That's the gravy. And that's really the only profit. It's not highly profitable. So you have to set like an attachment rate and say, hey, talk to make sure you're having a dialogue with your customer and that they're happy that this is their full in coverage. And if not, tailor benefits and add those in for them. And that's where you make money is on that. And I'm going to see a big shift in that as we're talking about the pain of brokers losing PDP commissions and how it's financially impacting them and everything else. We are going to continue to see a creep and an increase of the attachment rate and these ancillary products to the overall selling portfolio. Cor correct. Well, not only that, we know that benefits as a whole, especially dental vision hearing are going to take a pretty massive hit mm -hmm. um, and go back to more pre-2020, prior than that um, era of benefits where it got to the point where a lot of dental vision hearing benefits were so good across the board built into advantage plans that most people didn't find a need or value for a supplemental and, yeah. or a, an indemnity plan or, a, or a, one of those plans because the benefits and the exposure was so low. We're going to see that, that value prop increase again for a lot of those products. And that, again, agents... If you're a, one of these PDP, PD apocalypse affected agents, I'm going to use that as an opportunity to go sit down and review with my clients, try to maybe add one of these other policies, give them a good coverage review. And I think if you did that, you would not only replace that lost PDP revenue in general, but you'd increase, um, increase your attachment mm -hmm. rate, your loyalty, your, your residual and increase more revenue over all and, your business. And let's be, let's be honest. Is it a bad thing that you have to call your client a couple times a year or sit down with them on a regular basis? Like, no, I think that's a good thing if you're in front of them more and I'm not telling you to go be a scumbag and go be a peddler and go 
peddle your, you know, your, <laughs> your, yeah. your wares, Force people, you know, and, and, and strong arm people into buying crap junk products. I'm not saying that, but if you were really to sit down or at the kitchen table or have a conversation on the phone with your clients and ask them exploratory questions, you would find that a certain percentage of your clients really do want some of those products. And it's very easy to just attach that and they're going to be happier with you and find more value in you as their agent. So anyways, I think that's trying to to wrap it, trying to bring it home. So, Hey, we feel you, we feel, feel your pain brokers. We'll, uh, we'll all get through this together. There are, there are great things ahead. And as a friend, an industry friend, I'll give you a shout out, told me this week in every single TV show you watch with attorneys, with, you know, firefighters, with whatever, there's always some bar or pub that they get through at the end of the day. When your enemy's out there in the street, you you meet up at the bar and you're all chummy and friendly with each other. It seems like more than ever, we got to have some place like that, an ecosystem where we can all go and vent. Unite and, as an industry, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, let's, and let's do a better job of um, working with each other, venting frustration, but being able to work through it together instead of crapping on each other all the time. So thanks guys.